Hey y'all, this is Lauren Aikens and welcome to the Live in Love podcast. So each week I'm going to be sitting down with friends and family and talking about the different areas of our life where we get to live in love. We've also got some behind the scene things that we're going to get to share with you, even things you may not know, although you may have read the book, Live in Love. And I'm Annie F. Downs and I'm so excited to be here with Lauren and to get to be a part of this really special show. Listen, if you haven't subscribed yet, Go ahead and do that so you do not miss a single episode. And if you haven't gotten your copy of Lauren's beautiful book, Live in Love, the paperback edition is new and it's out now. And believe me, you want to get a copy. You can pick up your paperback copy of Live in Love at your favorite local bookstore or wherever you love to buy books. Okay, Lauren. So for our first episode, who is joining us today in this conversation about family? I'm so excited. So today we are sitting down with my dad, Steve, and my sister, Macy, to talk about what it looks like to live in love in family. Lauren, Live in Love podcast, episode one. Here we go. I mean, no one's going to be surprised we're starting with family. No. Yeah. That's Family is everything. And if you've read my book, that is very evident throughout. But also, if you just follow me on socials or... Really, even as people like introduce me around town, they're like, oh, yeah, you're the one that travels with like 18 people everywhere you go. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, quarantine was really hard for us because we don't spend time apart. Wait, did y'all stay apart during quarantine? Well, Well, Macy. I didn't. Macy and Tyler. (laughs) We lived with them for like two months. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Macy and Tyler lived with me. Also, my best friend, Lindsay. And then our nanny did come in. The second half after she had kind of quarantined. When Thomas Rowe was about to lose yeah, Thomas it. Thomas was like, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was really fun. But yeah, we, we do a lot together. I mean, family is so much of my life. And I think I speak for my whole family when I say that family is just literally in everything that we do. We do it together. And that includes Thomas Rhett's family. His mom and stepdad and brother and sister. And then his dad and stepmom and little brother. We do everything together, (laughs) but it's so fun. I would not have it any other way, but we are very overwhelming to people, I think, sometimes. (laughs) Because you run in such a pack. Yeah. My brain just doesn't even go there, which is probably bad. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we are overwhelming now that you take a step back and look, but yeah. Also, I should introduce, I have my sister, Macy, who you have heard, (laughs) and my dad, who you just heard, Steve, here with me today. (laughs) <laughs> to introduce a big part of my family. Thanks for having me. And Dad. Thanks yes, for being here, Dad. Th- thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, when I, I tell me about what you're experiencing right now, watching your two daughters kind of sitting here, both grown women with their families, and and they still love family. What does that mean to you? It's not a surprise. I, I'm, I just knew it was going to be this way when I met Lisa, so... Really? Why? Uh, uh, do, you, do I want to? Yeah, you, you, can go, you can do whatever you want to. Just know <laughs> that this will be public. Yeah. But it's okay. up to you. Um, I dated uh, girls that I, you know, fell in love with. And one in particular, it was three things that happened to me in um, around 1982, 83. Um, my parents divorced, which I had no idea that I was a reason that they I had to get married. And, you know, and I, and I say I was born in February, so May of 59, that would make sense, up at Tennessee Tech. Mom was probably laying out in the sun, and Dad comes by and goes, ooh, she's pretty, you know. And next thing you know, she gets pregnant. And they had known each other for about six months. They just kept it together all through school, high school, elementary school growing up, and I just never knew it. Mm. until uh, it all blew up when I was a freshman in college. It looked like it was going to stay together, and I got through college. I was dating a girl um, that I ultimately got engaged to and and, um, graduated from college. Um, I was uh, in the Navy, uh, in the uh, Naval Reserves. I was going to be, I wanted to be a fighter pilot and um, an engineer and, and learn, get my master's degree in engineering at Patuxent River, and then become an astronaut. That's what I hope to do. Oh, wow. And He's smart if you can't tell. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, when he came in the studio, he started, like, engineering the whole studio. I was like, this guy's smart. <laughs> so, the, the you know, it, I did all that for that one reason. I wanted to fly to space. And I I wow. wanted to do that since uh, the Gemini program. in Because uh, I was born in 60. So, the mid-60s, I, my dad would bring home books about it. 
they rejected me because I had sickle cell trait, and both my daughters have it also. And, of course, the Navy didn't believe it, and they said, well, that can't be. Look look at him. He's blonde-headed, blue-eyed. And mm-hmm. But nonetheless, I do. And if you look at – we've got pictures of my great-grandmother, and it came down that, that side – she was part black and part Cherokee, very, very dark, complected. Uh, but in the 80s, that was disqualifying as mm-hmm. a pilot. So they wanted me to operate a nuclear propo- or nuclear reactors on a big boomer submarine. That wasn't fun. Um, so I ended up getting out. My parents were ending their divorce, and my fiance shows up in Palm Beach, where I'm working at Pratt and Whitney at this point as a as a test engineer. And she spends the whole week with me to tell me at the end that she's been seeing somebody else and wish she didn't want to get married. So uh, it was awful. I'm down there by myself. It's the night before Easter in 1983, and I'm by myself in this. I didn't have any money, so I just had a rental couch and, you know, on a TV, and I I was just at the end of my rope. Mm -hmm. And... I knew it, and I kept praying to God. I really didn't know how to pray, but I did it because I had nothing else to do. I had no radio or, you know, that old TV. This time, I just knew I was at the end of my rope. And when I said amen in that prayer at the end of uh, watching Star Trek, the um, phone rang in the kitchen, and I went in the kitchen, and, and it was a friend of mine I hadn't seen in 10 years, and he says, I know where you are. I'm coming to get you. Now, I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. Born and raised in Nashville. I still don't know how he knew I was there. And this is before cell phones and right. all that. So That would be God. That's <laughs> God. <anyone's> <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my first experience. Um, the engineer in me knows we can calculate probabilities all day long, and, and th- there's no way that that's a coincidence any more than you, you know, imagine a tornado blowing through a big junkyard and out comes a Boeing 747, you know, you just don't see those things happen, <laughs> right? even if there's billions of years that pass, you know, and that's what cracks me up about people that don't believe in God, and I just don't understand how they can't look up in the heavens and see uh, that there's an um, ultimate boss that we're accountable to. So it, it got me out of the doldrums and ended up out in West Texas uh, as a petroleum engineer, and, um, and then the bad part of me was I started you know, sleeping around is, I guess, the best way of saying it. (laughs) It was awful. Uh, I shouldn't have. Um, I did. I just was kind of in a funk. And this girl, this is really the third time. I'm going to skip one. But the third time where I really had this, you know, wow, God's here. And she had told me that, you know, she wanted to date me. I I, I loved her to death, but just friendly. You know, I just, you know, didn't want to... date her, just be friends. And she knew it one night in Abilene, and she said, you know, have you ever thought that all you have to do, I can just tell you're unsettled. And I said, yeah, well, that's the truth. And she said, have you ever thought that all you have to do is pray to God? He's already got her, that, that, that girl picked out for you. It sounds like you're ready to get married. And I said, I am. I just, I just want to be with the person that I was meant to be with. And she said, None of it hit me until she says, I wonder what she's doing right now. Mm. And she said, you think she's riding a tricycle, you know, uh, right before dark near us? Do you think, which is kind of funny because I was 20. I was about to say riding a tricycle. Yeah, Yeah, but I was 25 at that time. And Lisa, I had not met her, was 18, my wife. And then she, she, and it started to click. And then she said something funny about, well, maybe it's, she's, it's still daylight and she's, washing dishes with her mom. And when she said that, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized, what else have I got to do? Now, the only thing I was doing in Abilene was I had a rental freeze refrigerator, a rental couch, a bed with a mattress, and that was all I had. No radio, no TV, nothing. Oh my gosh. So I'd come home off the road, you know, drilling wells. They seemed to always TD the total depth of wells in the middle of the night. So I'd come home late at night and was still amped up from all that we were doing on the drilling rig. And and I would walk in, and it was just quiet. And so I broke that quietness a lot of times in the springtime uh, hunting rattlesnakes. I did that with the 
some friends of mine, and we sold them to, to a big roundup in West Texas. And it was fun, you know, pour them out on the floor, and they're all, you know, that we had to keep them all alive. So oh, my gosh. You should, you <laughs> That's should, awful. You should hear it. In, He's in, got more stories in, than that. In the, uh, we don't have to go there. Apartment, yes. <laughs> all you can hear is it sounds like shh. That's all you hear Ooh, all over the house. Is they're all alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I came home and I really started focusing on praying. Came home to Nashville. No, no, oh, in my apartment in Abilene. Abilene. Okay, sorry, sorry. And I learned I wasn't very good at it for the first six months, but what else to have to do but keep trying? And before long, I got in the groove, and it was just I can't explain it. You just figure it out. And I, one of the things I love was getting down on my knees and staying balanced on my knees. And, you know, you see people do it in the Old Testament, New Testament, and, you know, it's a kind of a form of submission to God. But it also kept me very alert mm -hmm. because of the pressure I felt on my knees so I could stay really focused. And before long, I was praying at least an hour and not even realize it had gone that long. Gosh. Well, then after about 18 months of this, I, I could have become a monk I couldn't care less if I'd ever had sex again. I mean, I was complete control of my body. Now, all you guys out there know when you're in your 20s, you typically don't, but I did. Um, and it, it, that was a huge positive byproduct of staying focused on God. Then after 18 months, I'd actually gotten approved to go in the Navy the second time. So I'm one of the few people probably have two honorable discharges in the Navy, but mm. I was about four weeks away from uh, reporting to active duty, and I had this huge, I wouldn't say it's a dream. It was more like a vision because I was wide awake in the dream, and I used to do a lot of caving. Um, I mean, we a lot of technical caving with ropes and everything else. And I knew we were in a cave, and there was this girl that was about, oh, 15 feet away from me in this pitch black cave with this one bright light behind her. And I could tell by the deadening sound in the cave that I was in a cave. I, I could, I knew it was a large room because I couldn't see the walls. And and you're asleep. I'm dead asleep at two two in the morning, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I, I can't explain that. I've never had a dream before or after like that. You know how you have dreams and it's just weird, and you go, "Well, God, look at that horse go by with that tiger's head on it. What's that, what that in there when I'm talking to my mom? You know." <laughs> <laughs> just weird stuff, and then you forget it as soon as uh -huh, you wake up. Uh -huh. Not this. Um, I can still see it. If I live to be 100, I'll, I can still see very clearly what was happening. And she just stood there, and I could I could see the outline of her hair, just like if you blacked out that picture of Lauren there, and you couldn't see her, mm -hmm. but you could see the outline of her on that book cover. And I could see the clothes she was wearing, too. I could see the type and the, and the, the kind of the colors because of the light shining on them. Well, it's the only time I've ever woke straight up out of a dream, wide awake, screaming. I screamed the rest of the time, but guess I woke the people upstairs up because I said, that's her, that's her. I was, I couldn't believe it. And I couldn't go back to sleep, watch the sunrise. And I, it took about two days to wear off to just the shock of what I saw. And then it, it turned from shock to every single cell in your body the DNA is rewritten that you know for a fact that this is going to happen. You're going to meet this girl. Everybody always wants to know, well, what's, what was it like when you saw her? Well, it was nothing because I knew it was going to happen. And a couple of weeks later, a friend of mine, Brent Barrow, who's a great guy, was the president of the Abilene Christian or president of the student body at Abilene Christian because I lived there, so I got to make a lot of friends over in that area. And I used to take him flying. I had an aerobatic airplane that would fly as good upside down as it would right side up. And we'd go out over West Texas and do things you shouldn't do in an airplane. But um, it was a lot of fun. Um, Don't try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> so he be bugged me to go to church because he was preaching that night, Wednesday night. And I said, I am I can't. i got to get up. i got to be out on a drilling rig early in the morning. And he says, I'm coming to pick you up. It's the last time I do it, and I want you to listen. I said, all right. So he takes me to church, University Church of Christ, and he did a great job. And Brent, whether it's, you know, his family talk, has talked about it in the past, but there's, somehow he's connected to Clyde Barrow of Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, wow. Which is interesting. And one of the best Christian men I've ever known. And he's since passed away. I just had so much fun with him, so I do miss talking to him. He did a great job, and we're leaving, 
and we're walking down the st- uh, stairs of the church, and somebody yells for Brent. He turns around, and I turn around with him, and I look, and I see, I don't know, eight or nine girls, but one girl's taller than the rest, and I can see her kind of from the nose up. And immediately, every cell in my body knew it was her. And I wasn't freaked out. You know, everybody goes, well, were you freaked out? Nope. Because you knew it was going to happen. I don't yeah. know how to explain that. It's, it's, it was as, I knew it just as well as I knew it was going to take my next breath. Then all the girls kind of separated from her. And the next cool thing was she was standing exactly like she was in the dream. And she had the clothes that I saw in a dream. Oh, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Only thing different, she was about twice as far away than, than she uh-huh. was in a dream. So I walked up to her again before cell phones, and all her friends saw this guy walking towards her, and they're all, what, what's this guy doing? Who is he? And, and um, I introduced myself and said, you know, um, they kind of chuckled a little bit, and I said, I wondered if you'd be interested in going out on a date with me. <laughs> And so they all started laughing, and she said, I don't know who you think you are, but I'm practically engaged. And she'd been dating this guy for three years. I mean, gosh, 18, so 15 to 18, she's, you know. But still, I didn't know how old she was or anything at that point. They were kind of making fun of me, but it's the only time that I've ever stood in front of a bunch of girls that were laughing at me and wasn't the least bit embarrassed. I mean, I could have picked my nose and stuck a booger on the end of my nose, and I wouldn't have cared. (laughs) I just wasn't embarrassed. I said, well, that's fine. I said, I'm not going to bug you anymore. I'm going to give you my card. And I said, you're going to need tested to be tested before you get married. Make sure it's the right ones. You only get married. You should only get married once. And I said, and I'm your test. And they just <laughs> died laughing again because that did sound kind of cocky. But I didn't know how else to say it. And it was it. the truth. So I walked away, and they're all laughing at me. And then Brent says, Gregory, you ready to go? And so I said, yeah, let's go. So we go down the stairs, and I hear... Lisa's voice say, Brent, do you know him? And of course, we're about 50 feet away. And he says, yeah, he's he's one of my close friends and he's got an airplane. We go flying. And I looked at him and I said, how do you know her? And he said, well, she's like my sister. She grew up next to me and we grew up together. And I said, well, that makes sense. Again, I wasn't shocked or anything. And she walked away from all her friends and changed her mind and says, I want to go out with you. So the next day was a Thursday when she got out of school I, it's in my logbook. I took her flying in that aerobatic airplane, strapped the parachute on her, showed her how we'd have to, you know, get out and all that kind of stuff. Pulled plus five minus four G's on her, and uh, <laughs> she never got sick. And uh, she didn't think I could make her pass out. And it's so funny when you make somebody pass out because they had never think they did pass out. But uh-huh. she passed out, and, but she never got sick. And that was our first date. So. I, the whole story is when you pray to God and you stay focused on what he wants for you, then there's really, to me, you become so in tune with him that you're not really surprised at how things will turn out. Now, that doesn't mean you can sit back and turn on your family and put them on autopilot. There's still a lot of interaction, a lot of tough decisions to make, and a lot of things you have to do to make it right, but you just know it'll turn out okay. There's your short answer. <laughs> <laughs> that story is unbelievable. I know. How, have you known that your whole life? Uh-huh. Mm, yep. We sure have. I could probably tell it to you over again right now. Yeah. It's a good one. It's good. It is really That's crazy. usually people's reaction. They're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's wild to think we're sitting here. Mm-hmm. And you're impacting the amount of people you're impacting with your life because your dad started praying in Abilene, Texas. Yeah. Preach. <laughs> what? Did, I mean, what? what is going through your mind? I mean, you've heard this story too much, so you know. Yeah, it is, that, that story is like second nature to me now. Just, I mean, like Macy said, I could probably tell it just like I could stories in my own life because I've heard it so much. But to me, it's just fascinating to me, like the detail, like how detailed God is and how, I mean, you think back, like you could probably find stories just like this generations back of where he starts to set something in motion Mm -hmm. and knows exactly how it's going to play out. And he's got such a plan through the hardship, through the funny stories, through the boring stuff, like all of it, whether you see it in your lifetime or generations later, it's just incredible. His timing and his attention to detail, it never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Macy? I mean, I love hearing 
that story every I, it's like I, I'm hearing it for the first time again every time I'm it's just so intriguing it's crazy is that, but it's not do you how did you meet your husband college okay which, so similar to your dad. No, yeah, sure. well, exactly. <laughs> well, I was out of college. I, I was an engineer at that point. Lisa yeah. was in college. No, yeah. We, I met Tyler in school, and okay. he was actually engaged at the time when we met. So that's a crazy story within itself. Yeah, but. and it's kind of similar. Macy knew because I've been. I've told them both they need mm-hmm. to pray about it, and they got to get focused on it. And you called me as soon as you saw him. Yeah. I said, Dad, that's a guy. <gasps> I'll never I did. I was like, this is the craziest because I had just been very disciplined praying. I've never I'd never had a serious boyfriend. So I was in a junior in college and I was like, oh, my gosh, why? What is wrong with me? Why can't I like somebody for more than three months? Like, what's going on? <laughs> so I just started praying and was like really disciplined in it and honestly didn't even care about guys in general at that point. And then Tyler stopped me on the way out of class, didn't even know he was in my class. I just went to class to sit in the front row, take my notes, get good grades. Did you go to UT? Yes. And so he stopped me, and when he started talking to me, I was like, this dude is, oh, my gosh. He's so, like, wow. It's just different. And so naturally you go look him up on Facebook and see who he is, and I was like, he's got a a, a fiancé. It was like, he's engaged. This guy, I was like, maybe he really did just want notes from me in class. Like, that's, man, I really got different vibes, but wow, okay. <laughs> and Dad was like, uh, he's a guy. Like, no guy's going to stop you and talk to you if he's not interested. So, <laughs> long story short, went through the ringer with his breakup and me being in love with him and him still, I mean, he was engaged, so it's a little intense. Yeah, but big deal. What happened to me, So, too. I know, but, I mean, so... One point, I still was just so heartbroken and praying and literally felt, I've only felt this feeling twice in my life, but something just came over me. Not something, Lord, just made this, uh, it was like a warmth, that peace just went all through my body. Mm. And it just was like, it's okay. It's going to happen. Just let it work itself out. And so I called dad immediately and was like, I know that I'm super upset right now, but I have this feeling like I feel like God just told me it's going to work out and it's going to be okay. And we're going to be together. It just might, you know, just give it time and we're married. So it was it was really cool. I mean, the Lord's hand. I know. I know. Just working on a family, huh? <laughs> and Lauren's, hers is I mean, <laughs> completely different, too. So, yeah. I mean, whoever listens do, do, doesn't need to think it's going to happen the way it happened to me or Lauren or, or Macy or anybody else. But the key is they've got to pray. And they've got to get, I don't know, tied to God like you are in a three-legged race or something. They need to get that intimate back in the... 80s and 70s, it was easy to do that. Now it's not because of this podcast, because of this phone, because of internet, because of, you know, us engineers use the internet when nobody knew what it meant, except I guess Al Gore. But it's just amazing the amount of noise that's out there from media, Instagram, Facebook, people, I mean, you watch people sitting on a bus or something on an airplane, they just got the phone in their face. They can't even carry on a conversation. That is the biggest detrimental one aspect of life today that's going to keep people from God. They've got to turn the phone off or get away from it and walk out in the woods, walk out mm-hmm. in the nature where it's quiet. That's how you're going to get in tune with God. You got you can't hear him when all that's going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is that still true in your life? <laughs> Heck yes. Yeah. I've told you before, I've taken myself off of social media. I mean, I'm still, like, technically on it, but, like, I don't spend my time on socials. First of all, I found out that it was very unhealthy for me. It just was not a safe place for me (laughs) emotionally, Mm -hmm. physically, mentally, spiritually, all the things. But, yeah, I mean, it's the same way. Well, and especially I've got little kids now, so if I'm paying attention to other stuff, I'm missing so much of what's going on around me and just like he's saying, get out in nature and get out in the woods and get out in the quiet where you're able to hear and experience God. It's the same way for me, but then also just watching my girls. I mean, mm. like watching my kids grow up and having conversations with them is also where I 
am able to experience God, but it's so easy to like hear your phone going off and be like, well, let me get this text first and be like, oh, I've got three other texts. Let me check those. Or, oh, this person needs me to do this now. Oh, they sent me an email. Let me just check this email really fast. I've noticed that if I give it just a little bit of attention and intend for it just to be like 15 seconds on a phone, every time it turns into more, it just sucks you in. And so, yeah, Tom Stratt and I both are trying to be better about like setting it down somewhere in the house and just walking away from it and just being present where we are with our kids, with each other, with the people that are in our house. Or like the other day, (laughs) I was showing Willa Gray and Ada James clovers. We have a bunch of clovers in our backyard. And I was teaching them about four leaf clovers because that was something I used to love to do growing up. And another thing that we used to do growing up at my parents' house is it would never fail. Like whenever there was a meteor shower coming through or whatever, dad would get us up and we would go outside and lay in the yard and watch the meteor shower or we would get in the middle of the road we lived like on a dead end so there wasn't much traffic in the middle of the night um but that was something I used to love to do and then when my friends would come over we would you know we'd be inside doing something and after supper I'd be like well y'all want to get blankets and just go lay outside and look Look at the the sky and talk Mm. and so that was like something that we just grew up doing so the other day with Willa Gray we were outside and Willa Gray just kind of laid down and put her body like in this huge patch of clovers. And she was mm. like, it's so soft. And the sky was so blue. And there was like the best wind, like just just enough to like cool you off in the hot sunshine. And I just laid down with her and we both just laid there and just talked and looked at the clouds going by in the blue sky. And I probably have not done that. I've probably like 15 years, I bet. Mm. And But getting to do that with her, like, I was immediately back in my yard at my house with my friends and my family. And I I could have missed that moment so quickly Mm -hmm. if I had gone inside to get on a phone call or check something or be like, okay, it's getting kind of hot. Y'all want to go inside? And y'all get a popsicle. Well, I'm going to check some stuff on my phone. But instead, choosing to put down the noise of the world, it was like the sweetest gift getting to be with Willa Gray, just laying in that clover and just having conversations with my five-year-old. It was amazing. But that's something that we did growing up. But there also weren't the cell phones around then either. But I hope that's something that we're able to instill in our kids and teach our kids. It's an amazing tool, but to teach them to have very strong and healthy boundaries with it. Steve, what's it like to have grandkids? The same as it is when I had kids. Uh, To me, it was like, I I think I was most impressed to watch... Lauren and Macy and Grayson come out like how are they uh-huh. <laughs> underwater living underwater and they're just having a great time underwater living and then in a split second now they take the first breath and they can't go live underwater anymore or they'll drown yeah that's all I was thinking about other than that it was like well that's a baby and <laughs> that's an ugly baby <laughs> Every single, a lot. every single one of them. So they look like aliens. It's like, Ugh. but uh, I don't know. I've, I've. It's probably just a mental quirk in me. It's like yeah, that's awesome. Like, that's an awesome thing to think about. I, I, I don't like go nuts and jump up and down and hey, look at me. I'm a granddad or dad. Uh-huh. I don't know why, but I don't. Uh-huh. Sorry. As I mean, it, I love them to death. It's, yeah. But it's just. Uh, I I always think of the weird stuff and, you know, and like a birth, you know, that other people aren't thinking of. And, you know, people always, all the ladies were saying, isn't Lauren so cute? And I'm going, no, not yet. You think I'm cute now? Yeah. Thank goodness. (laughs) My goodness. Yeah, babies are weird when they come out. But like I still heads. think they're cute. Mm-hmm. They're so sweet. Yeah. That's oh yeah, I get that. But, and a when's the yeah. next one coming? Not anytime soon. Okay. Oh, what about you, Mace? Not until I can not buy to go food. Uh, well, oh, uh, yeah. we all I agree with what they all said on our family text. You just you gotta just. I mean, we didn't have any money when we had y'all, but. Yeah, Macy just and Tyler got trust. into this debate on yeah. our group family text. Tyler yeah. in front Tyler, of everybody. In front of everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Tyler was like his brother just had their first little boy on that side of the family and he was like, I finally have a nephew because me and Thomas. It's all nieces. Just yeah. him nieces. <laughs> and so he was like, Macy, I'm ready. When are we gonna do this? And Macy's like, uh, when we're financially ready. <laughs> And he's like, no, the Lord will provide. And I'm like, exclamation marking all of that. And then somebody 
Who said y'all need to wait? Mom. Mom, Mom goes, goes, until you cannot buy food for a yeah. month, like at a restaurant, then you might be ready. And I was well, like, well, I just ordered Chipotle, to so that's not <laughs> happening yet. Yeah. <laughs> that is good. It's a good rule of thumb. If you can go a whole yeah. month without doing that, because you do you need just that need money to, for diapers. I, I'm, uh, this is the way I look at it. You just go ahead and ha- get pregnant, and then you got no choice. Sounds but, very uh, responsible. That's the way it was with us. I didn't. Ha- I had no desire to had have kids. Didn't even think about it. But it was mom that said, "I want." Well, of course, the first time she kind of cheated and quit taking the pill. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, and look at me now. Yeah. And yeah. look yeah. at me now. <laughs> but I, I mean, I didn't care. I just best I, oops I just, that's ever. Well, I am <laughs> not pulling the goalie anytime soon. So. <laughs> I just, I, you just, you just um, deal with it as it comes. That's, Maybe that's next it. month. We'll, we'll yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Maybe next month. Okay. I say that just to get people's hopes up, and then. <laughs> oh my gosh! Don't do that. Then it's gonna make me want to get pregnant again. Ooh. I can't do that to myself right now. Yeah, I, I need a not. little. I need a little bit of a break. In when you want to get pregnant again, and then the I'll pull the goalie. Well, you don't want to wait that long. I'm gonna, a, I don't know how long we're going to wait, but I just need a little break between the okay. first three. Yeah, well, we'll workout. see what happens. All in God's timing. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. I think an interesting thing to talk about as well is y'all have also had a hard couple of months of loss and mm-hmm. Tyler's accident. So, Macy, talk about, like, when your husband gets in an accident that he gets injured. And, like, how did your family step in to help when he's hurt? Oh my gosh. Um, well, mom and dad were there when it happened. And so when we were about to get in the car, I mean, just uh, my family and friends are unreal. So, I mean, they all just are phenomenal. But one of our friends drove us to the hospital, but dad took one look at Tyler's head, which he busted open. It was like, oh, I can butterfly that. Just let me tape that one shut. <laughs> well, Not the, even close. Well, the reason I do that, he was dazed. Could see and, his skull. No, I know, Literally but, could but, see his skull. But anytime the kids got hurt, Mm -hmm. the first thing I would do is deflect their pain, their fear of what's going to happen next to, oh, look, look at that airplane, or it's a helicopter, or whatever, or make light of it. And that's just my habit. Oh, that's just a flesh wound. That's not (laughs) Yeah. So I walk out and see... Because he told me he, like, was bleeding a little bit and (laughs) doesn't remember calling me, so he was concussed. And I was like, okay, he's got the whole thing of paper towels over half of his face, and he's got blood down his shirt. And I was like, it's probably not a great thing. And so he takes it down, and I looked, and I was like, okay, we're going to get in the car. We we probably should go get you stitched up. You know, like, we can't. That's not one you should, like, put a Band-Aid on. And I think in emergency situations, I've learned that I kind of, like, almost don't react. which are just very chill. Yes. And maybe sometimes too chill. Because <laughs> I'm not, I don't feel like a sense of urgency. I mean, I do, but it, I don't know. Anyway, so we went to the hospital and got him. He was, he's fine, by the way. Um, gosh, I'll never forget the phone call with Lauren when I was sitting in the parking lot waiting on Tyler because COVID, I couldn't go in with him. Right. And I was like, he can't even remember, like, he asked me where our insurance card was five times on the car ride over here. Like, how is he going to know what to do in there waiting in the emergency room lobby, like, to get back to your room? So Lauren called me because they were at the beach. They were out of town. And honestly, at that time, she was more upset than I was and started crying, which made me start crying. And I was like, it's fine. It's okay. It's going to be fine. Like, I was trying to console her because she was so upset about it. I mean, that just tells you my family's heart. Like, they care just as much about Tyler as mm-hmm. they do, like, her own husband or, and I mean, obviously in different ways. But, I mean, just so worried. And they have got contacts with head doctors, like head injury doctor up in Pittsburgh. And, I mean, went truly above and beyond. I can't even explain to you the gratitude I know for sure Tyler feels because he's had concussions in the past. And so it was a little bit scary as far as his head goes and trauma. And so we got to meet with the doctor. And that's actually the second time that I got that like whole piece of like wave of peace over my body feeling when I was praying in bed the night before we were about to fly out the next morning to go see this doctor and I was just, Tyler was thinking he was going to get some news that he was, has the, what is it, like CTE or whatever, yeah. that whole. And so he was freaking out. I was very anxious and I was just praying about it. And that peace came over my body and I immediately turned my head over to Tyler and I was like, 
this is going to sound really weird, but God just told me that it's going to be okay. Like everything's going to be fine. Your head's going to be fine. Nothing's going to be. And so we got there the next day and went through everything. And the doctor literally was like, you have nothing to worry about. Wow. Like you're, I've seen all of these NFL guys. Like I've seen, I've been able to compare. And he was like, you've got nothing to worry about. You're going to have to work on it, but you you don't have whatever you think you have. You don't have it. Mm. And so it was just the biggest blessing that if that had not happened, if Lauren and Thomas Rhett had not been who they are for us, we wouldn't have gotten to meet with this doctor and honestly had this reassurance for the rest of our lives that we wouldn't have had that, especially Tyler, because he's always been worried about his head with the Mm -hmm. concussions. And so... Because he played football all his whole he life played, and in yeah. college. So the amount of concussions he has had and how traumatic they have been have been very dangerous. And so one of his doctors told him one time, like, you really don't need to hit your head hard again because it could be mm-hmm. it could be detrimental to your health mm-hmm. and to your mind. And then that accident happened. And so, yeah, it was just it was crazy. So for him especially, it was like he won't have to stress about that forever. Like, for the rest of his life, he's not going to have to worry about his head like that. It was just a good, which if the accident hadn't have happened, he wouldn't have known that either, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's almost a blessing in disguise. Never a fun thing for that to happen, but such a blessing that it did because we got to learn and figure out, like, oh, actually, we can just not worry about it ever again. Like, that's Mm -hmm. so awesome. So, I mean, my whole family has just been such a huge, I'm, I'm just a big family person i want to be with them 24 7 i'm sure tyler's probably like okay so we're gonna have like one day at home where you want to just hang out with you know not have to like go do other things with (laughs) lauren and thomas red and the girls and your mom and your dad and grayson and i'm like but it's so fun to be with everybody it's so much fun lauren i know y'all have grieved lately too i know steve i'm sorry about your mom losing her so recently what's it been like as a family to walk through grief as well as joy. I mean, you've had accidents, tragedy, you've had babies, you've had (laughs) great times at the beach and grief. I think whatever it is we're going through, like we go through it as a unit. I mean, it is Mm. the good and the bad. It is something that we never experience alone. That has brought more peace and strength and encouragement. I mean, you just... For me, I feel so much hope in our family because no matter where you look, you know, if you've had a really traumatic accident, you've got dad going, you're going to be just fine. Or (laughs) Butterfly that. (laughs) Yeah, butterfly that. Um, Or, you know, with with the babies, dad may not act like he was excited, but but he was. And, you know, this may be TMI, but with both of my biological kids— he sat outside, like behind the curtain, while I pushed for hours with Ada James. And then while I screamed in agony with Lennon because I was determined to have her naturally. And he sat behind the curtains the whole time. Mind you, he's 61 years old. He does not have like a very good body. Like he's the healthiest. <laughs> He's the healthiest person I know, but he was not dealt the best hand of cards when it comes to, like, his joints. He's had, like, Six double surgeries. knee replacements, double wow. shoulder replacements, yep. a hip replacement. <clears throat> I shouldn't have played football. I was, well, I was too skinny. All that to say, sitting on a hospital room floor. <laughs> oh, my gosh, on the floor. For hours waiting wow. for your grandkids With to be born. With his little backpack right beside him. <laughs> to me, that, jerky to in me the that sounds like a little bit more excitement than than just thinking it's cool how they come out. How they can breathe um, all of a sudden. So, yeah. I don't know. Just having that support has, I mean, it's changed the way that we live our life because we have such a safety net in our mm-hmm. family that we never feel like we're having to do anything alone or process anything alone. And I do feel like I should add, through Tyler's accident, as traumatic as that was, because it should have been infinitely worse. And what actually happened was they were at our farm on one of our razors, on one of our like Polaris, you know, what are they called? ATVs? That's not an yeah. ATV. Uh, I think it is. Well, it was, but it know. wasn't that razor. It was that the hunting one. Well, I can't even tell you the difference between them, mm-hmm. but Dad and Tyler and Thomas Rhett could. Regardless, Thomas Rhett had just, we'd just went out there the week before with our kids, and Thomas Rhett had put Willa Gray and Ada James on that one and tried to start it, and it wouldn't start. Mm. So he took them out and put them in the other one, and they rode around that one. When they're just riding around, he doesn't stick helmets on them unless they're going to be, like, going on trails. Tyler 
gets on this one, it starts all of a sudden a week later. We don't really know why. Well, I do know why. It was God saving my kids. But he went to go get a pizza just up at the gate. I mean, he was literally driving down a gravel road and not really going fast at all. But he put his seatbelt on just to go get the pizza. And he was like, I don't even know why I put my seatbelt on because I usually, if I'm just going to go grab something at the mailbox, I won't even stick my seatbelt on. He was driving back on the gravel road and the axle snapped in half. And when it did, it it shot the axle into the ground and then he lost all control and steering. And Tyler is the biggest person in our entire family of 20. He's the biggest guy I know. <laughs> And the fact that he was the one in that seat when that happened is what saved his life. Wow. And, and the fact that he had that seatbelt on because he spun out and hit a tree. And if that had been my, my husband or my children, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know what would have happened. Mm-hmm. And I think in that moment when I realized the weight of A, how Tyler walked away from it, mm-hmm. and B, that it was just a week off from that being a way more tragic accident. And the way that Tyler was like, I was just thinking through, this was the same one that Thomas Rhett said didn't work last week. And he was like, I'm so grateful God put me behind that wheel mm. for your kids. And it was just like, God, he, like, you literally don't know what your life is about to turn out. Like we're in the middle of this trying to figure out if you're going to be okay, if your head's going to be okay. And all he's doing is encouraging me because every time he walked through the door at my house at that point, I would just start crying yeah. because it was like, <laughs> it, it made me sick to know how much worse that should have been. I think I was just in you're not supposed to like dwell on like what should have happened or whatever. But to me, it was just the way of knowing what could have been and what wasn't because of the grace of God, I truly believe. But that Tyler was trying to encourage me (laughs) every time he walked through the door (laughs) because I was a basket case. And um, well, the image of his face did not help every time after that either. I feel like when Lauren told me a story the first time, he picked up the pizza. Didn't he still try to bring the pizza? He cleaned up after himself. He cleaned up after himself as he can't even see because he's got just red in his eye. He can't even see. And so he's cleaning up his mess to walk all the way back to the barn. His crib tonight is pizza. Yeah, yeah. He the man can't loves, resist a pizza. He apparently. can't. Truly, no, he can't. I mean, so, it's unbelievable. But, but all that yeah. to say, like through my grandmother's passing, through all three of our kids coming into our home, through marriages, through job losses, through friends that we lose, and then all of, like the joys that our life brings, and even the small things of just like, hey. Nobody's doing anything on a Friday night. Y'all all want to come over and spend the night, and it just turns into, like, a big family party. Mm-hmm. It's, like, to me, that is what family is, is you, you're never doing anything alone, even if it's just sitting on a couch doing nothing. You've got family to – you're never alone, and we have so much fun together. It is – it's just, it's unbelievable. And I know that we overwhelm people when we walk into a room, but I can't. Or a restaurant, maybe. Yeah. Oh, dude. I mean, <laughs> we don't even try that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Aiken's party of 20. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't have it any other way because it has changed my life for the better. And I and it's changed my friends' lives. I mean, you bring any friend into this family circle and all of a sudden my dad's line is always like, if you're with us, you're family, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from. If, if Lauren loves you, then I love you. And so that's just kind of the way we've been raised. And so I think that all of us kids, even Grayson, who's living out in Montana now, I mean, we've all been raised to just like everybody is welcome to sit at the table. Everybody can be a part, no matter what you believe, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like or who you are, how old or young you are, we just, I have been taught to be inclusive of everyone. That is one of my favorite lessons that I, I, it's like a pillar to me. It is like a pillar of my life and who I am, my heart and motivation behind life is to include and love everybody. And Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the best lessons that my parents have ever instilled in me and my sister Mm -hmm. and brother. Agreed. It's amazing when you, bring kids that are different from the neighborhood, bring them in, and and it's it's amazing the things you learn from them. Uh, I, I, I can think of many of them that came over the house, uh, and I always wanted, no matter who it was, if they wanted to bring them over, they could. Some of them were questionable <laughs> in what they were doing uh, outside of, say, school, mm-hmm. but I didn't mind them at all being in our house when I was around, or Lisa was around. And I think 
in the end, it made us better, made them better uh, as the kids grew up. I was so glad to see Lauren and Macy, and Grayson was the only one that wasn't there when my mom uh, died Sunday night. We just, right there with her, she's taking her last breath, you know, and and I, <clears throat> I miss her. Um, I will miss her more, I'm sure. I see little things I hadn't thought of looking through pictures in a long time, but I, I keep thinking, what was she seeing as she was leaving? And, and again, here I am going off on a tangent thinking about stuff like that, but that's what I was thinking about the most. And, of course, every morning I wake up as one day closer that I'm going to be in heaven also because that's one thing that's you know going to happen is we're going to die. And I'm not afraid of it, and I don't think the kids are. Um, if you could have seen them, they were just rock solid. And, and the friends that I keep, I have some very close friends. Uh, Tim Best died about, uh, what, three years ago? Yeah, or two, and three. And <laughs> uh, that whole Best family is just the greatest. Um, but anyway, uh, he he said, well, Gregory, uh, you've been trying to tell me to go get, go to the doctor because I've been losing weight. He was, a, he was a huge guy. He's the first guy that knocked me out in football. I mean, completely <laughs> just knocked me out. And I'm waking up, you know, and again, when you get knocked out, you don't think, or you get blacked out, you don't think you've been knocked out. And I kept thinking, why is that guy hanging upside down looking down at me? Because I thought I was standing up, but I was <laughs> laying on the ground, everybody's around me. And um, so after that, he kind of became like my guardian, big, big guy um, when we were playing football. And um, he said, well, Gregory, I guess I should have listened to you. I got some bad news to tell you. He said bad news is I've got pancreatic cancer and it's terminal. It's, it's way too late to do anything about it. But you know what? The good news is I don't have to cut grass anymore. <laughs> well, here's a guy that's going to die in less than three months. Wow. And that's how he looked at life. And my friend Todd, his little brother, and I were camping this. Again, this is, you know, we always camp out in East Tennessee. We've been doing it since we played football and we went to college and caved, went caving together and uh, up at Tennessee Tech, there's was millions of caves up there on that karsty terrain. He, uh, <laughs> we, we get, we get to the, well, we're going camping, but we decided about six months earlier, Lauren said, we ought to come out to our farm and do something different because we always camp in tents out in East Tennessee or a lot of times we just laid on the ground, but the bears and the coyotes were getting a little bit thick out there. Um, <laughs> So I, I quit doing that. Um, it's a miracle you're still alive. <laughs> um, but um, we went over there to, to camp at Lawrence, and that's when he got really sick and he went downhill fast, so he had to go to the, the hospital. And so we followed him, and he's, you know, in that gown, you know, and big guy still, and he's, he's rubbed my ears, you know, because he always likes to have his ears rubbed. So I'm rubbing his ears, and he says, rub my shoulders, rub my back. You know, let me get back in the chair. Let me do this. Well, he gets back in the bed, and he says, give me some ice chips. So I'm getting some ice chips, and he's starting to feel better, you know. And then he just, Todd's saying, Timmy, he calls his brother Timmy, you need anything else? Well, Tim's about, you know, a foot away from me. I'm just to his left, and Todd's straight in front of him. And Tim just chewing on the ice, and I'm getting ready to put another one in his mouth. And then he just spits it in Todd's face and exhales and looks at me, and his eyes got big, and then he just died right there. It was, again, kind of like me seeing my kids. I knew it was going to happen, and, yep, there they are. I knew it was going to happen. Now he's leaving. He turns, you, they turn gray so fast, mm -hmm. um, and I know doctors and nurses have seen that a million times. Mm -hmm. w again, we know where he is, and we're sad. We miss him, but it's so funny. We were together a couple of weeks ago at uh, some of my close friends at Lawrence Farm, and, and Todd, the whole thing, he laughs about it. He said, we're praying for the food, and Todd's saying something to God about, you know, tell Timmy and Dad I said hello, and and uh, and then Todd starts talking about, yeah, Big Timmy, last thing he had to do, he had to get the upper hand. He had to spit in my face for his, <laughs> before he died, you know. <laughs> it's so funny to hear him say the story, but I, I don't want to make light of of death because it, the, the worst part is you, you, you miss them. Mm -hmm. But the best part is if you really get focused and, and look out there in the universe, look in nature. I tell the kids all the time, you walk into the woods and you see this 
nice clearing and all this underbrush, but then there's two rows of corn and two rows of tomatoes and and no weeds in between. Well, what do you think that caused that? Was that just by chance or intelligence? Mm-hmm. Well, it's intelligence. As somebody made that. Well, then you look at the DNA in our, just one strand of DNA in our body has enough information in it to stack, you know, oh, nobody knows what phone books are anymore, but you know, <laughs> phone books, two, two, two piles of phone books about 20 feet high, that's that much information in a kind of like binary, but it's not. It's, it's actually four uh, bits of information. If that were to fly in from outer space, somebody would say proof of intelligence. Mm-hmm. But yet that's in our body, and people just gloss over it. And if people can just quieten their mind and get in the groove, and it takes focus to get in the groove, you know, like Grayson got his pilot's license. Well, to fly a Cessna 172 is a real feat, but it's easy. Once you get your pilot's license, it's easy. And that's the way I think so many people, the Christians today, just kind of, it's easy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a private pilot. But if you go to all the way to the level of an airline transport pilot, where we take check rides every six months, and we know how to drive down a runway, you know, that's a quarter mile visibility at night with a ceiling above you at 200 feet, and you lose an engine and you're steering with your feet over 100 miles an hour and you still got to accelerate, it wants to jump off the runway at that point when, you, when the engine blows, and you climb out and you're focused. The focus is just unbelievable. And so you stay focused. Professional pilots like that guy that lost that engine at 777, that was, all right, we got to do a checklist. We got to do our thing. We, we do our memory items and we do our checklist. And, you know, it's we train for it every six months. That is focus. And if you can get in the groove like that and get out there in nature, you are, I would suspect, you will become a focused Christian and not a, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, and, it, and it will m- make such a big difference in your life if you can get to that point. From life to death, you know, from somebody being born to somebody dying, you know, it's just, it just makes life so much easier. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. That's beautiful. So at the end of every one of these episodes, we're going to ask the same question. I haven't told you all this yet, so you're going to have to just wing it. You're going to do great. Okay. Uh, Macy, <laughs> coming at you first. <laughs> okay, great. What does it mean for you to live in love in our family? Or what does it mean... When you hear somebody say, I'm going to live in love within my family or in a family, what does that mean to you? Or how do you like to live in love with family? Well, my brain immediately jumped to, obviously, we all love each other. But I think even when we want to kill each other, which happens probably a lot. For me, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what anyone does in our family, I think I, I mean, it just, it, it'll always be love for me. I'll always choose love just because I feel so strongly. I mean, you can do no wrong because that, I mean, that's just how deep my love is for everyone. I mean, just the way that God loves us. Good night. Unconditional. Unconditional. Okay, dad, what does it mean to you to live in love and family in our family and a family? What Mm. is your idea of what it would look like to live in love with a family? Well, it, again, I go back to the best family, you know, all the way from when we were teenagers, the candle of love. Um, Tim always had a big old Timmy had a, and when we were all camping together, he would always buy a Sea Island cotton candle and have it lit the whole time to, to signify the brotherly love we had for each other. Mm-hmm. So the bottom line is you can say things you'll regret for the rest of your life. Uh, using the word hate. I've certainly done it. Um, But in the end, you love the person and you don't quit on them, just like God loves you and he doesn't quit on you. Unconditional. Yeah. you, you, You end an argument, somehow you've got to just dig it out of your gut and say, but I still love you. Because you do. If you can just end any bad situation with the word love. I mean, if I could sum up the Bible in one word, it's L-O-V-E. That's, I mean, that's 66 books. That's a library. It's encyclopedia. But that's the best way to describe that library of books. That's the way I see our family is that we 
love each other. Sometimes, yeah, like Macy says, you just want to smack them because, you know, what in the world are you doing? Or why are you just staying on me about this or whatever? But in the end, we all love each other. Okay. Lauren, I'm going to ask you in all these episodes too. Okay. So after this conversation, when you think about it, what does it look like for you to live in love and family? I think to live in love and family oftentimes means putting your family first. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think it's that way in marriage, which also is family and kids. But putting, putting your family first and their needs, but then also loving them well through the hard things to where sometimes the conversations are hard, but you know that's the best way to love them in that moment and and in their success to be able to celebrate them well and make them feel celebrated and loved. And then just even on the, the dull moments or the the mundane where, you know, mom's over at the house and she's like, all right, well, I'm going to go get groceries and go home to your dad. Always remembering, like, she never leaves the house without giving me a hug and telling me she loves me. And so, like, that's something that I, like, this morning when I was leaving to come here, I was talking to Mackenzie, who was at the house, our nanny, they were all in the kitchen, all three of my kids, Thomas, Ray, and Mackenzie. And as I was walking out of the house, I was like checking off some work list stuff to, with Thomas, Rhett and Mac. And I left the door. I just kissed all my kids, but I left the door and then realized I didn't look at my kids and tell them mm-hmm. that I love them. So I went back inside and I said, girls, and they're kind of looking up, you know, from their <laughs> breakfast. And I said, I love you. And they were like, I love you. But it's like, to me, that's something that I will never not do is that tell the person I'm with how much they're loved or at least give them a hug and let them know it for feel that, that love coming from me. So that's what it is to me. Thank y'all so much for listening. I love getting to share these conversations with y'all. If you love this episode, please rate it, review it, share it with your friends. And also, reminder, you can pick up your copy of the paperback edition of Live and Love. It's available now. And I hope you'll join us for our next episode of the Live and Love podcast, where we'll be talking about what it means to live in love in community.